Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you must increase and I must become less and less. Lord, you must become bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter in my life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence today, Lord. In your name. Everybody said amen. amen. So we're in a sermon series called From Jesus to the Church. And this is week three of that series. And in case you have missed it, I want to encourage you to do something. On our YouTube channel, we post all our messages. Tim uh, spends a lot of time editing it and putting it together, and he does a great job with it. And if you have, if you miss one of the messages or, you know, not really understanding and want to just go back and listen to it again, it's there for you. So I want to encourage you, go listen to the messages. It's free. All it's going to require is you to take a little bit of time and listen to it. So, um, but we're in week three, and here's what it's about. It's about the gifts that Jesus gave to the church. And sometimes um, I have noticed, and maybe you have noticed this too, um, a lot of people, I shouldn't say the word a lot, that's kind of big, but there are people that try to take these gifts and jumble them in with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to make sure I'm super clear on this. Don't do that. Okay, because these are not the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are the gifts of Jesus. Jesus himself gave these gifts to the church. And I want us to make sure we're super clear. Um, I, uh, I had somebody come up to me last week and ask me a pretty awesome question. And they asked me this because I believe the Lord wanted me to explain it. They said, hey, Pastor, I know we read uh, where... It talked about that only some of them will have these gifts. This isn't for all of us. So if I'm not one of those gifts, why do I need it? Why do I need to know about this? What's so important about it if I didn't, if I didn't get one of these gifts? And I want to explain something to you. Number one, Jesus himself gave it to you. The second thing I want you to know is this, is that they didn't get a gift. I did not get a gift. I want you to hear me clearly. I am the gift. Understand this, okay? I'm not trying to be arrogant or prideful when I say this. I'm explaining to you what Jesus done. Jesus himself gave me to you. There are other gifts. And at the end of our series, we got two more. I'm going to stand, get all the gifts that Jesus gave this church, and I'm going to have them stand up, and we're going to show them to you. That way you'll know, hey, if I need encouragement, I need to go to this person. If I need to know how to be a better pastor and a shepherd, I want to go to this person. If I need to know how to be a witness to somebody, I want to go to this person. This is the purpose. This is the purpose. And I want to make sure we understand that I don't have a gift. I am the gift. And you know what's so good about this? You can't return me. Yeah, there's a no return on that one. And the point I'm trying to make is this. Is some of us may say, well, I don't necessarily need that. Jesus himself thought you did. So if you have a little bit of an a issue with, well, I don't need those gifts. I don't need the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. Well, you know what? The manufacturer thinks you do. How many men we got in the room? We're getting to that time of the year where we got to put a lot of things together, right, at Christmas time, right? How many dads, right? It, and all those toys come with instructions. Most of us... We don't even get that out of the bag, do we? You know what I found out? Every time I do not read the instructions, I get to the very end because it just looks simple, and there's this little piece that I cannot figure where it goes, and it's the main part, and it should have went step one. And then you got to turn around and tear it all down, right? 
Why am I telling you that? Because Jesus, as the manufacturer, says, you need me. And you need to read the instructions. And the instructions tell you that there's an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. And they must all be used. It's important we understand it. It's important to know the manufacturer, God, put in the instructions, you need these. So if you're asking, why do I need them? Because the manufacturer says so. Amen? So we're in week three. First week, we talked about the prophet. Last week, I'm mean, excuse me, first week, we talked about the apostle. Last week, we talked about the prophet. This week, we're going to talk about the evangelist. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, where we're getting this from, verses 11 and 12. Amen. Let's read that again. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. What are they for? The equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher are gifts from Jesus himself to the church to equip you to do the work of the ministry. You know what's sad? Is you see many of these people who operate in these gifts don't really understand what they're here to do and they're doing all the work. And the saints are just watching. That's backwards. The Lord will not bless the house that way. That's why I want him to bless this house. That's why you need to know that when one of us walk up to you and say, hey, we want to equip you to go and do what God's called you to do, you need to receive it. If you want this house to be uh, prosperous and successful and continue to have more people come and continue to say, the Lord say, I can trust this place and send people to you, we need to work in order. Amen? Amen. So let's dive right in. Number one, what is an evangelist? What is an evangelist? Some of you may say, Billy Graham. Yes, Billy Graham was a great evangelist. Um, why? Because he shared the gospel. He shared the gospel. Um, I'm going to do something uh, real quick, and I just want you to pay attention to me, okay? I'm going to do a little bit of an explaining. I'm going to kind of probably talk over some of your heads a little bit. And I'm going to share some Greek with you, how this was originally wrote in the Greek and translated, because I'm going to make a point, because I found it this week and it blew my mind. So Billy Graham shared the gospel. <laughs> I looked the word gospel up because I've always just heard what the gospel was, right? Well, it, I mean, here's what, it, here's what I want you to see. We can pull up on the screen the word gospel in the Greek and I'm going to read it for you. You angelon. You angelon. That's how you say the word gospel. Okay? Now, I've got this word evangelist up here as well. Why? Because in the Greek, it's the next word down. I found that pretty interesting. If you go to the Greek, the lexicon, and you pull up there, there is the word euangelon, and then the word right below it, is you angelist. And what does that mean? Evangelist. You know what else I found that was similar with these? Look at these two words in the middle of both of them. What do they have? The word spelled. Angel. And what is the definition of angel? A messenger. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only guy in here that thinks that's awesome. <laughs> So what's the difference between the two of them? Because they're very similar. What's the difference? So the word gospel is referring to a person that carries the good news. Okay? The difference between the word gospel here 
And the word evangelist, it also is referring to a person, but they don't carry the good news. They deliver the good news. Man, I tell you what, this is going to be good today. Y'all already not even talking to me, just looking at me. <laughs> Let me say that again. The word gospel in the Greek here in this context refers to a person that carries the good news. The word evangelist refers to a person that delivers the good news. Now I want you to listen to me. If you have accepted Jesus into your heart and he is Lord of your life, you carry the good news inside you. Say it again. If you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, you carry the good news in you. But there's a problem. Getting you to deliver it. Right? Yeah. In other words, let me say it to you this way. Don't be like a mailman who drives around all day but never delivers the mail. I want you to think right now, let's just think about this. Let's use my dad as an example, okay? He's been disabled because of the situation he's in, and he is awaiting a letter in the mail for him to be accepted for his medical bills to be paid for, okay? Because he's not working right now. Let's say that that letter is in the mailman's car, and it needs to be delivered today so that he can get the information. But let's say that mailman just drives around all day long and never delivers the mail to him. He would never know. He would be waiting. Why, why, why are you sharing this with me, Pastor? Because many of you have some news inside you and there's somebody in here waiting for you to deliver it to them. Help me, Lord. We carry it, but we don't deliver it. And I want you to know that everybody in here has a message. Every one of you has a message on the inside of you. And that's what it is. It's a message. So that leads me to my second point. What is my message? You may be asking that. When I said it, oh, I got a message in me. I don't even have a clue what my message is. Well, according to Corinthians, the word gospel is defined in three words. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the good news. There's good news that God's son lowered himself to the status of a man came and walked this earth, lived a sinless life, you know, sometimes I get up here and I just start speaking, trying to make points, and I forget what he really done for me. He saved me. I've jacked it up so much, y'all, and he still had mercy on me. Amen. The gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And because of that, it's good news. Because I get to be with the Father. But here's what I found out about the gospel there's an introduction, there's an introduction that preludes the gospel. You know what that is? It's your message. Let me say it a little differently. It's your testimony. Let me change it up a little bit. It's your story. It's your story. So what is my message? It's simple. It's your story. That is your message that you need to deliver to somebody. Your story. Your story. I'm looking right now in the room. I see so many stories. Amen. 
that needs to be delivered. So many stories. You know, one thing I know uh, about my story is the devil tries his best to tell me my story ain't good enough. And you know what? That ain't just me. He tells every one of y'all that. Nobody gets left out. He says, well, your story ain't good enough. You know, I was thinking the other day, you know, I've pretty much been saved most of my whole life. My wife, she's got a much better testimony than I do. Jennifer, way better testimony than I do. Sean, my goodness, he about got one. Him and Miss Carol, they about got one better than all of us. That's what I think. But I was sitting there last night going over this, and the Lord said, Jay, I think that's a pretty good testimony since you've been nine years old. You've served me. And in that moment, the lie broke. But that's what the devil does. He tries to tell us that we don't have a good story. Now, there's a word in our, in Christianity, that's a real scary word. And none of us really like to hear it. It's the only scary word in Christianity. Y'all ready for it? Witnessing. We don't like to hear that word. Oh, no, Pat. Oh. Don't it always hit you when you're at the gas pump? And you make that awkward look with the person over there beside you. No, Lord, I'm not telling them they love you. I'm not doing it. I think I need to go get me a drink. Hopefully they're gone when I get back. And then when they pull off, you feel convicted. Man, I should have done that, Lord. And then it's like another verse pops in your head. Lord, you said if I deny you in front of me and you deny me, I go, yeah. Yeah. Right? Thank God I ain't the only one in here. Witnessing, it isn't something that we do. Witnessing is who we are. We are a witness. Okay, I want you to understand that. You are a witness. You know, I love what Jesus was saying, and I want to show you something real powerful about how the gifts of Jesus tie into the Holy Spirit. They're different, but they do work together. But Jesus says something pretty powerful. Um, he says this, you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what he was talking to his disciples, and he was telling them, you'll be my witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, I want to point this out to you because I want to make sure we show a clear distinction here. What does the gifts of Jesus do differently from the gifts of the Holy Spirit? As simply as I can put it, the gifts of Jesus equip you and the gifts of the Holy Spirit empower you. The gifts of Jesus equip you and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they empower you. Okay? You are a witness. I got a question to ask about this because everybody needs to know you're a witness. So here's my question. Do you do it? Do you witness to people? Just think about it. So what is a witness? This is important right here because I'm about to make a solid point. <laughs> a person that has seen and heard something, that's the definition of a witness. A person that has seen or heard something. Now, some of you may think, I thought a witness is a guy that goes to court and tells something. No, not all of them, because some of them plead the fifth. Some of them said, no comment. You know, when I was thinking about that, I thought to myself, my goodness, some Christians plead the fifth. That's what I, I've done it many times at the gas pump. I plead the fifth, Lord. Yeah. And don't catch the person going down the aisle when you're in the grocery store and you're in a hurry. And when they turn the corner, you hear the Lord say, tell them about me. And I'm like, Lord, I ain't doing that. And you know what? I plead the fifth and walk right by them. It happens. It happens. I just want to encourage you from this point forward, don't do that. Don't do that. Tell your story. Tell your story. And you may be asking, Pastor, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how 
I don't know how to walk up to somebody and witness to them. Can I be honest with you? It's a lot more easier than you think. It is. You, you, give you the best, you give you the best method that I use for it. I think it's the easiest one. You ready? Y'all ready for it? It's a million dollars right here. Get them to tell theirs to you first. Walk up to them and just say, hey, how you doing? You know, I really feel like the Lord wanted me to just ask you a question. What's your story? And they'll talk, and out of obligation, they'll say, well, what's yours? Every time. Every time. So the next time you're in the store or at the gas pump, no matter how awkward it is, say, hey, I'm sorry to bother you. This may be kind of crazy, but I feel the Lord asking me to ask you, what's your story? What's the deal with you? And they'll talk, and they'll talk. And then they'll say, well, what about you? What's your story? And then you give them your story. Tell them what God's done for you. You know, um, I want to show you some things real quick in Scripture about people, all they did, let me tell you this, we think that when we get ready to witness to people, we've got to know 15 scriptures, we've got to have elegant speech, we've got to have the verse Romans 10, 9, and 10, we've got to lead them down the, the sinner's path. No, you don't. You just need to tell your story. And the Lord will do his job. Okay? I want to show you in scripture where some people, all they did was just tell their story. You ready? Luke chapter 2, verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. The shepherds, okay, when they saw Jesus was born, what did they do? They didn't go doing anything else other than what? Telling them what they had heard and seen. That was their story. They didn't come up with 15 other different things. All they did was they told people what they seen and what they heard. Now I want you to look at uh, John the Baptist's disciples. They go to Jesus and listen to what he says to them. Chapter 7, Luke chapter 7 verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the <laughs> lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Mm -hmm. They come to Jesus and ask him. John sent them to him and says, Go ask him if he's the Messiah. You know what Jesus' answer was? Go tell him what you've seen and heard. Go tell your story. That's all he told them. Now I want you to uh, look at uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 20. This is Jesus telling his disciples this. Chapter 4, verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. These are Jesus' disciples saying this. They're asking them, about Jesus. And what do they say? Well, I can't speak about anything other than what I've seen and heard. That's their story. You see how simple it is? They didn't have a bunch of verses. All they did was say, man, i seen him. I, Peter said, i seen him walk on water. You can't, you can't deny that. i seen it with my own two eyes. I can see James and John says, man, I seen him in a crowd and a woman grabbed the back of his garment and immediately she was healed. I seen it. They just told the story. Now I want you to look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is talking to a man by the name of Ananias. Okay, and listen to what he says. Verse uh, Acts chapter twenty-two, verse fifteen. 
for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Paul is telling Ananias, he said, Ananias, listen, man, you don't have to worry about anything. However, I don't want you to say anything other than what you have seen and heard God do through me. Seen and heard. You see that's a, a, an ongoing thing here, right? Seen and heard. That's a witness. You know, um, do you realize something? I, I don't know if you realize this or not. But you can sit here in this room or you can get online and you can have a debate with somebody if the earth is flat around. <laughs> you also can get on that same platform and debate with those people if dinosaurs are real or not. I've even seen them where there's a debate whether pigs can really fly. You know one thing you can't debate? An experience. Let me say it differently. You can say all you want to. You can't debate my story. I experienced him. Let me tell you what I seen and heard. My Jesus do. It's your story. Um, Sixty years after the uh, after Jesus, uh, the resurrection. Um, there were a, a group of men that rose up and they were going around saying, hey, we got to talking to some other disciples that used to follow Jesus and the resurrection really didn't go that way. And, you know, Jesus really didn't do some of those things. So they were basically going against what was being said about Jesus. And John who was with Jesus, Jesus says this about John. He's the one I love. Writes a book to combat what these people are saying. He writes the book of 1 John to, com to, to basically combat and say, no, you, you jokers, you bunch of idiots. I want you to listen how John starts off with a rebuttal to what they had to say. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, mm -hmm. and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, mm -hmm. and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us... That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, let me just sum that up for you. <laughs> he said, I don't care what you're thinking or what you thought you saw. I've seen it with my own two eyes. I experienced it. i seen it and I heard it. I didn't get this from somebody else. I saw it with my own two eyes and I heard it with my own two ears. You know, uh, that's all we have to do is just share our story. That's it. Just share your story. How many has ever witnessed a wreck before? You ever seen a wreck? I want you to imagine, let's just say you're, all, you're walking and you're at a stop sign and in the intersection there's a wreck. And both of them are saying, well, it was their fault, it was their fault. Well, you get called to court as a witness. When you go to court, do they make you go through a uh, manufacturer's class on how the vehicle operates? They don't? Do they get you to go to a mechanic school to find out how the brake pads actually stop the vehicle? They don't make you do that? What do they make you do? Tell them what you've seen and heard. That's it. Just tell them what you've seen and heard, and that is your story. That's your story. You know, I had an incredible opportunity about, I don't know if it was two, three months ago, it may be a little longer, but I got to go to court. 
Um, and I got to go to court with one of my best friends. Uh, many of you know Sean's story. Sean's got a pretty rough past. He'd been in and out of court, got a dadgum uh, record, probably long as some of y'all's is, uh, um, well, I take that back, probably long as my daughter Fallon's what she wants for Christmas. Because every day she gives me something new. We get in this courtroom, and there's a ton of people in the room. And Sean's right here, and his wife Paige is right beside him, and Sean's a little nervous. Because every time Sean has been in the court, he never leaves. He goes on to the back and goes to jail. That's what he told me. He says, Pastor, I'm a little nervous. I sure hope she don't lock me up today. And we get there. I wish y'all all could have seen what I saw. I saw a man stand up, and I know he was scared to death on the inside. And we walked up to one of the most intimidating moments where there is a judge literally has the power to take everything from you or set you free. And she, listen, I, lo- I thought it was most incredible. Listen, I'm not here to do no shameless plugs or whatever, but man, Judge Joy Booth is an incredible judge. I saw it in, in, with my own two eyes. And I watched her give out justice the whole day. They were folks going to the back left and right. And I thought to myself, Lord, you will not let him go back there today. And let me tell you what happened. Sean stood up and she said, Sean Headley. He said, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. And here's what she done next. Whew. You've been busy. You got a pretty good record. And immediately I saw something happen. Yes, ma'am, but I'm not that guy no more. That's what he did right after her, right after she said that. I've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life, and I'm now a new person. That's what he said. He said that. You should have watched what she did. She went. What did he do? He told a story. He told his story. And you know what happened after he told his story? I am convinced she experienced the Lord in that moment. And a woman that had been given justice all day long extended grace. And wiped that man's record clean. All Sean did was tell his story. That was it. The third point, and my last one, stick to your story. Stick to your story. That's all you need. You don't need to try to come up with this awesome plan, throw 15 scriptures in it and sound super spiritual. Just stick to your story. It's powerful enough. You know, I can remember when Sean, uh, he first accepted Jesus. He was like, by the way, the guy's an evangelist, in case you're wondering. He is a gift to the church. Um, he was sitting there, Pastor, I don't, I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't. He goes, I'm just a simple man. I don't know how to quote all in scriptures. He don't have to. He just needs to deliver the message. His story. His story is enough. His story is what will set someone free. And he needs to stick to it. Stick to your story. Um, we're going to read uh, several verses coming up, but I want you to watch this. This has got to be probably one of the most funniest passages of Scripture you'll ever read. 
but it's about to drive home a point, okay? We're going to read about a man that stuck to his story. Y'all ready? John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Let's start right there. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born mm. blind? You know, when I read that, all I could think about was why did the disciples ask the question, who sinned that this man was born blind? You know what I noticed? That they were more concerned about their system. Their, let me say it this way, their religious beliefs and what they were taught. Because they were taught that if you're blind, it's because your mother and father sinned. Then them walking up to Jesus and saying, Lord, can you heal him? Let me say it to you a different way. Many times in the church, we're more concerned about why somebody's on the stage singing that's been divorced than we are about saying, Lord, can we pray for this person? In the church, we're more concerned about highlighting somebody's faults than we are about praying for our brother and sister. That's what happened right here. If you want to know a good definition of what the word religion is, all it is is a glorified structure. It's a system based off of beliefs. It ain't done nothing but destroy people. Let's move on. Verse 6 and 7. John chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, yep. which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Look how simple that story is. That, that's really a simple story. He was blind. Jesus put clay in his eyes. He went and washed it off, and now he can see. That's a pretty simple story. But I want you to look at how complicated and confused it got. Stick to your story. Here we go. Verses 8 and 9 now. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Mm -hmm. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Now I want you to watch him stick to his story. You ready? Let's go. Verses 9, I'm excuse me, verses 10 through 13. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Oh, so they brought him to the church, folks. Brought him to the church, folks. Let me say it this way. They brought him to the religious people that try to lord over people with legalism. How many has ever experienced that before? Say you missed the mark in something. And you just want to repent and move on. But they want to walk you through a 15-step process. You got to quote uh, Psalms 91 by heart 14 times. You got to clean the toilets for three months. Just a, just a, a, a strenuous, just make you want to give up. Those kind of people. That's who they took him to. All right, let's go to verse 14 through 16 now. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Mm -hmm. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay in my eyes, uh -huh. and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, 
This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Oh, Lord. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Do you see that? <laughs> they looked at a man <laughs> that just got healed, was blind, but now can see. And they said, well, he ain't from the Lord. And the church folks, religious people got together and started, bam, 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 bam. And look what happens. That word, division. Division. You know uh, where the word division comes from out of the Greek? Let me say it. Let me just read it a little bit for you differently. And, and there was a denomination among them. Denomination. Now, I'm not here to preach against denominations, okay? But what I am telling you is you need to understand what is the first part of denomination? Denomino. If I've got any smart mathematical people in here, you understand what I'm about to go. Okay? If you have a f two fractions and you want to find the common denoma, what do you do? You divide. So, division comes from the word denomination. That's why today, if you look at the church, you have so many denominations because it is divided. Mm. Why? Because people are not sticking to their story. Let's go 17 verse 21. They said to the blind man again, <laughs> What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. You ready? And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? It's hilarious. How then does he see now? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. Yeah. Let me, let me just say it to you how it really went. That's a grown man, ask him yourself. So what was his answer when they asked him his story? That was his answer. That was his answer. Verse 24. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to see something here. I talked to you earlier in this message about the gifts of Jesus equip us and the gifts of the Holy Spirit empower us, I'm about to show you in Scripture right now the word of wisdom, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit with power. All right? Ready? Here it goes. Verse 25. He answered and said, Here it goes. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. All right? That's the word of wisdom right there. I don't know about that, but let me tell you what I do know. I was blind, and now I see. You know, I looked that up in the Greek. You know what that says in the Greek? Stick that up, you pop and smoke it. Yeah. That's basically what he said. <laughs> Let's go on verse 26 and 27. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Many times he's told Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Ah. Well, <laughs> that, look, 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 here it is. That's the Holy Spirit in him that gave him boldness now. This joker done got boldness in him. He goes, you want to be one of them? That's pretty bold. 
All right, now let's look at verse 35. We're getting ready to close. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? So when the verse before that, when he told them, Do you want to be the disciples? They began to chastise him and said, You ain't even been to seminary school. How can you educate us? That's what he said to them. And then you know what they did? Those Pharisees, they kicked him out. And when they kicked him out, that's what Jesus said. When I heard that they had cast him out, Jesus asked him a question. Do you believe in the Son of God? And it goes on, it says that he asked, Who is he so that I may believe? And Jesus looked at him and said, I am him. Evangelists equip us so that we can deliver the gospel and tell our story. This is what the evangelists do. Everybody in here has a story. And you need to tell your story as often as possible. And it's not difficult. And you can do exactly what I told you, and it will work. And let me tell you the most important part about it. When you experience fear or anxiety, when you're getting ready to tell your story, here's what I want you to say. Holy Spirit, fill me with boldness. And that prayer will get answered every time. And evangelists help us, teach us to do that. Amen? Stand to your feet.